Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Our production will begin in approximately one minute. One minute. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Our production will begin in approximately one minute. Very, very dreadfully nervous. And I had and am been. But why will you say that I am mad? <laughs> the disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in heaven and in the earth. I heard many things. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthfully, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It's impossible to say how the first idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object, there was none. There was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. One of his eyes resembled that of a vulture. A pale, blue eye, with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold, and so, by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man, and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now, this is the point you fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded. With what caution, with what foresight, with, and what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it. Oh, so slowly. So gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern all closed, closed, so that no light shone. And then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. But 
took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Ha! Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously. Oh, so cautiously. Cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I did for set. Undid it just so that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture's eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night just at midnight. But I found the eye was always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he had passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in on him as he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious, opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did I. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph to think that there I was opening the door, little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now, you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness, for the shutters were closed fashion, through fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in, and was about to open the lantern, when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up in bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept still, quite still, and said nothing. For a whole hour, I did not move a muscle, but in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening, just as I have done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently, I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief. Oh, no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt. I pitied him. Although I chuckled at heart, I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the 
first slight moments. When he had turned in the bed, his fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, it is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor, or it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he found all in vain. All in vain, because death, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he never saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very crevice in the landing. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, how stealthily, until at length a single dim ray, like the thread of a spider, shot from the crevice and full upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue, the hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely upon the damned eye. And now, have I not told you what you mistake for madness is but over acuteness of the senses. Now I say there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating. of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous, so I am. And now at the dread hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excitement uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart must burst, and now a new anxiety seized me with a loud yell. I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. I shrieked once. He shrieked only once. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then
then smiled gaily. To find the deed so far done, but for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sigh. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there for many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, you will think no, so no longer when I described the wise cautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to watch out. No stain of any kind, no blood spot, whatever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had come off it all. <laughs> when I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight, as the bell sounded the hour. There came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? there entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by the neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for what had I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own from a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, well secured, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner convinced them. I was singular at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted familiar things. But ere long, I, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat, and still they chatted. The ringing became more distinct, 
it continued and became more distinct. I talk more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definitiveness until at length I found that the noise was not within my ear. No doubt, I now grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased. And what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such as a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I thought, I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I, I, I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and I argued about trifles in a high key and with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides as if excited to fury by the observation of the men. But the noise steadily increased. Oh God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards, but the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, louder, louder. And still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible? Heard not? Oh, mighty God. Oh, no. They heard. They suspected. They knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This, I thought, and this, I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could not bear those hypocritical smiles any longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now again, hark, louder, 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 louder. Villains, I shrieked, dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks here and here. It is the beating of his hideous. For this event, I would like to thank some sponsors for our Center for the Arts. I'd like to thank the Victor Lundin Company, Country Inn and Suites by Radisson, the City of Fergus Falls, Lake Region Healthcare, Service Food, The Market, Downtown Riverfront Council, Northern Lakes. Dental and Implant Center, Bell Bank, Thrive and Financial, Kurt Nygaard, American National Bank, Visit Fergus Falls, Tim and Lisa Litt, Pemberton Law, American Inn, <laughs> my bad, American, American Federal Bank, Otter Tail Power, Lake Region Arts Council, and the Minnesota State Arts Board. Thank you all. And now, The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as if someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember, it was
was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow. Vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow. Sorrow for the lost Lenore. For the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore. Nameless here forever. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, tis some visitor entreating entrance to at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, that is it, and nothing more. Presently, my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, I said, or madam, truly, your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce, scarce was sure I heard you, and here I opened wide the door, darkness there, nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortals ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping, something louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Uh, let me see then. What thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he not a minute as stopped he or stayed he, but with mine of lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly, grim, and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, never. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird about his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculpted bust above his chamber door with such a name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on that placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, Other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird 
was a nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and story. Caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster, till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hopes that melancholy burden bore of never, nevermore. But the raven, still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then, upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to thinking, to linking, fancy unto fancy, what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore, meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er. She Then, methought the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted, tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee by these angels he hath sent thee. Respite, respite, and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether temper sent or whether tempest tossed here, tossed ashore, desolate, yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. And quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, a thing of evil prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels named Lenore. Clasp a fair and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting, Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave me my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, Still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor.
that's Elvira, let's say. Unpleasant dream. 